Hello, hello. Welcome to Sawyer's provider webinar for January 2023. Today, the focus is going to be on children's activity industry trends from this past year, 2022, as well as actionable insights for how you can use that information, how you can have it help inform your business decisions for 2023. So let's dive right in. My name is Dylan. I'm from the accounts team at Sawyer. Uh, many of you already know me and have worked with me a lot or a little bit. Uh, for those of you who don't know me yet, hi, nice to meet you. Dana is with me as well. Uh, I'm going to be talking a lot today, for which I apologize in advance. Uh, you are more than welcome to participate as well, especially in the chat. Dana is going to be very active in the chat. If you want to unmute quickly and just say, what's up, Dana? If you don't, that's okay too. No, I don't. No, hi everyone. I'm super excited <laughs> to be here. Um, definitely chat with me. Let us know a little bit about who you are, your business. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. Super excited to kick off the conversation today. Cool. Thanks, Dana. Sorry to put you on the spot there. I'll try to avoid that going forward. Um, let's see what we're going to do today. First thing I want to mention is that we are recording today's session. So if you have to kind of do other work and be distracted a little bit while you're here, that's all good. You can always watch or listen back. Uh, if you have to jump off early because something comes up, as things often do in our industry, that's all good too. Or even if you're paying attention this entire time and you just want a refresher in a couple months from now, that's also awesome. We're recording it. You can hop back in, rewatch, re-listen at another time in the future. If you are here participating live, please, as I mentioned, I encourage you to use the chat. Dana will be hanging out there. You can start now by introducing yourself. You can say your name if you don't already have it programmed in, maybe the name of your provider, your organization, uh, maybe what you do there, where you are, the kinds of things you teach. We'd love to hear about all of that. And as we continue the conversation today, I encourage you also to participate, ask questions, um, sound off about how things we're talking about sound familiar, maybe sound very different than your experience. These, these webinar conversations tend to be much more rewarding when the uh, there's a lot of participation and providers are sharing their experience as well. We always really enjoy that. And I know many other providers do as well. Okay. So here are the different topics that we're going to talk about today. First, we're going to start with a summer camp marketing timeline in January. Yes, that's right. We'll talk more about that in a moment. After that, we are going to talk about Sawyer trend report takeaways. So this is kind of what I mentioned earlier. We're going to spend the most time on this today talking about what was happening in our industry in 2022 and some takeaways for us from that info. And finally, I'm very excited today to be able to share a little sneak pre peek, excuse me, a sneak peek, a preview of the next big feature that we're going to be releasing into the Sawyer universe. So more about that later. But let's start now with your camp marketing timeline. So, okay, some context for this. Depending on where you are in the country, Camp may be a summer camp, maybe like a little bit different, but in general, June to August. But that, of course, means that you need to be selling registrations way before that. And we'll talk more about that later when we look at the trend report. But essentially, the idea is you need to give people time to research your camp, to set up their summer well before the summer. And it may be helpful for you to, if it's helpful for you to get order sooner, as uh, it very often is to reward that type of behavior, to incentivize people to buy earlier. So I'm just gonna go through a month by month timeline of the months starting now leading up to summer camp. So January through May, so bear with me. So right now it's January and we're already actually most of the way through January. January. Um, but this is really when your summer camp countdown should begin should start um and whether or not you do this literally i mean you can you can literally put like a countdown clock on your website and say like you know this many days this many hours to summer camp i've seen providers do that that can be fun but it should really be how you're thinking about things right now whether or not you're doing that literally 
even if you don't have many camps have already launched their summer camps taking registrations that's great if that's you if you haven't and you're not ready to that's also okay depending on where you are it may seem really early to be launching camp um, but you should at least acknowledge that you will be doing summer camp this summer because for people who are starting to do research and look around very often families are looking at their whole summer and trying to piece things together and even if there's someone who already knows they're interested in your camp if they go to your website and it doesn't say a word about it they may think okay never mind i guess we don't have to factor that one in so at the very least say something like check back soon for details on 2023 summer camp something that i like to suggest is you could put a little widget or email address collector on your site that just says hey if you're interested in learning more about our summer camp we'll let you know be the first to know as soon as we announce our summer camp something like this and what you're doing is you're collecting a list of people that you know are interested and you can uh you can send an announcement to them later so uh, in other words at the very least say you're going to do summer camp and it's a great time to to consider doing special offers for people who buy early for returning customers loyalty discounts these are the people that you know this is low-hanging fruit right so people who have experienced your programming in the past presumably they had a great experience presumably you're doing great work here as i know many of you are all of you are probably right uh you can these people know how good your stuff is they're the people that it's going to be easiest to get to sign up again in the future remind them of that reward them for coming back moving on to february which it almost is there are some great opportunities to do like schools out camps here so president's day depending on when school other school recesses are this is a great opportunity to be open when school is closed and potentially introduce yourselves to new families you don't already work with who may just need something on that day it's also a great opportunity to preview summer so even i mean you could literally do like okay this is the same content we're going to do in the summer or like start your summer project now and finish it later or maybe it's not that literal it's just like hey come have a great time with us and then but it's really really it can be really smart to connect the that experience to summer in some way so maybe hey you came to our president's day camp if you sign up for summer camp by the end of the week you get this discount in order to do so or even by the end of the day maybe even at pickup if you do it right now you get hundred dollars off I don't know what it is if you haven't already launched summer camp now is a great time to do it in February um March is really 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 big summer camp month so getting a little ahead of that is is really great um another thing to consider because March is such a big month another thing to consider in February is other types of promotions that you might want to do whether depending on your community maybe there are camp fairs maybe there are camp directories that you can look into and potentially be a part of some of these things are really expensive and not worth it some of them are very expensive and worth it some of them are not very expensive and worth it um, see what's out there February tends to be a good time to look into that stuff again because of how big March is so let's talk about March this is really this is like your big summer camp marketing month month and I know it feels like far away from summer um but this is a huge month for people to buy camp which another reason to launch earlier than that is it means that people are researching very often before that also the other thing about March is because your school year because uh, families essentially have a feel for what their after school and school year activities are already in March it's okay to do like a full summer camp takeover of your marketing materials so email lists socials it's okay in general at this point to focus solely on summer camp um this is really the latest that you should launch summer camp um that's not to say that if you somehow for some reason don't get it together in March you shouldn't bother in April but much better to do so in March so that's when a lot of people are registering the other thing I'll say here is any discounts that you offer should have really clear ex, uh, expiration dates if it's like an early bird or a really clear tiered discount offer so if it's like a you know buy more uh you know like a quantity discount right buy two week get ten dollars off whatever it is either way you just want to make sure that 
the discounts that you're offering are really clear. The last thing you want to do is give someone a discount that they didn't even know they were getting and would have purchased without, right? Very often I see providers offering every single type of discount that they've heard of just because they've heard of it and they think they should. Really, the way you want to think about offering discounts is as a way to incentivize some sort of buying behavior that you want, right? If you want people to buy earlier because it's helpful for you to understand demand in terms of age range or content or you know what weeks of the summer are most popular, then you want to do early bird, right? If it's if it's if, if that's not important to you, then maybe don't do that type of discount. But it's very easy easy to get carried away and do like a early bird, a quantity discount, a sibling discount, a loyalty discount. And before you know it, you're discounting way too much and you would have gotten those sales anyway and you're leaving money on the table. So think about your discount in terms of like the behavior that you want to incentivize and make sure that people who are taking advantage of those discounts appreciate them. Okay, moving on to April, still talking about discounts. This is really when you want to start to have your best offers, your early bird discounts, your loyalty discounts expire in April or sometime around then, depending on when you launched CAM. Um, this is also a great time to think more about target marketing. Maybe there's a specific, you know, by, by this point, if you've already launched CAM for a little while, you may have a sense of what weeks are selling better than others. And you may be able to say, okay, this week is selling more slowly. Let me try to promote it more. Or the opposite. You may say, this week is selling really well. Let me lean into that. This is really what's working for me. Let me do more of that. Maybe even I'm going to cancel some stuff that's not popular. But either way, by this point, you'll have a sense of who you can target, either because you think there's some untapped potential there or because it's already working and you want to do more of that. So you can you can be a little bit more specific about who you want to say what to by this point. Okay, moving on to May. This is really like, May is kind of last minute, right? So if June through August is camp, May is school is winding down, maybe it's ending, depending on where you are, it's definitely ending. Uh, and maybe summer camp is starting already in some, in some cases. So this is really like you're getting down to the wire. And this is what I call FOMO time, because this is if people don't get summer camp now, you can assume they won't. Maybe some people sign up along the way in the summer. Very often, that's people who start with you and then like it and continue, which is great. But we're just talking about the lead up here. So the best thing you can, the way I think about May is this is the time to make people picture their uh, their children participating in your camp, picturing being able to visualize what they would be missing if they didn't sign up. And you know, something to keep in mind, and the Trend Report talks about this a little bit, is odds are pretty good that the if you're marketing to to summer camp parents this year, you're probably largely talking to millennials. Millennials are people who like experiences, Instagrammable stuff. So the more you can do to emphasize what it's actually like to experience your camp, the more you can give it a visual and help people picture that the more they're going to understand it and picture their kids there. Um, one way to do this is by highlighting the content, like what projects will they work on? What will they walk away with? Another way to do this is to highlight you and your staff. If there's, you know, if you do like a little bio, I've seen this work really well of a, a particular camp counselor, for example, who has some interest, whatever they're into, whatever they're going to teach. It might be more easy for, families to picture their kids connecting with that particular instructor. And maybe they want to sign up just for that. Anything to, to help them visualize what it would like, to, what it would be like to have their kid at your camp. And that's it. And then we're at summer. I know that was a lot. Uh, this is, again, we're recording this. So you do have this if you want to reference it. And again, there's, this is, you know, you should take this a little bit with a grain of salt and align it more to what your expectations are. This is, um, I think, depending on where you're at, things could be moved up or back a month, or some things could be jostled around a little bit. But in general, this is the flow for summer camp marketing. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not looking at the chat. I'm sure there are some people who are um, who are feeling certain parts of this, who are not feeling other parts of it. 
if there, Dana, feel free to, to jump yeah. in and share. Yeah, we have any- some really great comments going on in the chat just around, you know, how do you get the word out? People participating in camp fairs, which I love. Um, questions around, you know, what kind of offers to test. One thing that was shared in the chat um, from Treasure Trunk was that if you want an easy way to collect emails, uh, doing a raffle, $100 off of camp. Um, doesn't always have to be discounts. Some things that we talked about here is like by planning out your marketing strategy like this, you can also be really mindful around what kind of incentives and offers for specific audiences. Um, one of the questions that Susan actually mentioned was if you have a week that's underperforming and you want to do kind of a targeted coupon code or discount, how do you do you offer that discount to people who have already paid? Um, how do you kind of target it to, you know, net new audience of, of customers and being really thoughtful around that? So the the chat's been really great around sharing some suggestions on how to kind of restrict it to new customers only, can't be applied retroactively, and then obviously focusing on a targeted list to make sure that you're really only focusing on a discount for brand new customers. Yeah, great. Great call outs. Awesome stuff in there. Yeah, something we've talked about in past webinars, but I'm really glad to hear it come up again is again around discounts is when you're offering incentives, they don't doesn't necessarily have to be a dollar amount or percentage off can be. So, for example, if you're doing a loyalty incentive to say, hey, come back around this summer. Didn't you have fun last summer? Maybe you get a free T-shirt or something for camp. Right. Um, Something like that, that maybe is less of a cost to you. Um, still very meaningful and special feeling for that family. Um, and the other thing, this comes up a lot too. This is a great question. If we're going to start to discount weeks that are slower, what do we do for people who have already purchased those weeks? Do we offer them a retroactive discount? And this to Dana's point, um, and anyone else who was saying this in the chat, this is where targeted targeted marketing really comes in handy because yeah, if you just were going to all of a sudden lower the price of that week, you certainly would need to um, want to do the same thing for anyone who'd already purchased it. But if you're doing a targeted thing that happens to highlight that week and say, hey, if you are XYZ, maybe came to summer camp last year or participated in fall and you want to check this week out, then that qualifies it in a way that doesn't necessarily mean you need to open it up to every single person. Um, In some cases, it may be worth opening it up to every single person, but um, that's something to consider as well. Cool. Thanks for for participating, everyone. I appreciate it. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna move on now from this camp marketing timeline. I know we've spent uh, a while on it already, and we will. <clears throat> I, sh- I know you're gonna spend a lot of time on it over the next couple months too. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. We are going to talk about the trend report now. So the first thing we need to do is say what the trend report is. So the trend report. When I say the trend report, um, every year. We at Sawyer look at all the data that we collected in the previous year. We look at the trends um, in our industry, the children's activity industry, and then we issue a report of our findings. And the idea is to help educators understand what's going on right now and how things have changed. And they certainly have changed over the last couple of years. Um, So this past year, we looked at 7.2 million bookings that occurred in the Sawyer ecosystem, which is a new record for Sawyer um, by a lot. My computer is loading slowly, but you will see this in words momentarily. momentarily. There it is. Um, In 2022, 7.2 million bookings, as I said, that's across every single state in the country. And that's a 44% increase from the previous year, 2021. So a lot of data to look at here. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the trends that stuck out to us. So what can the trend report tell us? The idea is when you have a sense of industry trends, you can make more informed business decisions. That's the concept, right? That's why we share this with you. Here are some of the things that the trend report includes. How far in advance families book, demand for in-person versus online activities, the next bullet point, which will load momentarily, top activities by region, average price increases, most popular class start times by age, and this probably says, and more, because there's more. Yep, yeah, lots more. Okay, another important question, what can to tell us? I just wanna be upfront about this. So the trend report, our trend report 
looks at data from providers we work with. Doesn't look at data from every children's activity provider across the entire country. Um, not only because we don't have this data, but also because this data doesn't like always exist, right? A lot of times children's activity providers are flying by the seat of their pants, not necessarily taking great notes or keeping great records of things. A lot of pen and paper. Sometimes the paper gets thrown in the trash. Sometimes there's no pen and paper. It's just all in here. I think some, many of us have had an experience with that at least a little bit. Um, so in other words, this data doesn't often exist for in the industry. So what we can do is we look at the data we have. So we're looking at Sawyer providers. But again, 7.2 million bookings is a lot. So I do think that there's there's um, a lot that can, can be gained by looking at the data that we have, a lot of insight. Another thing I'll mention is that even though it can, it can be really, really useful to look at this info, it's not going to tell you what to do. And you, I don't think you should want it to either. Um, I think it's impo always important to remember that, that you know your, your organization, your business, your community, your family's best, your students' best. So while it's really helpful to look at the, the data here that we've collected and to kind of get a sense of what's going on in the industry more broadly, you, you don't necessarily want to just try to copy that stuff because that may not make sense for you. Okay. Let's look at some highlights that I pulled out. And there's more in the in the report, which we published, and, and you can download and look at on your own as well. But I'm just going to look at some things today that stuck out to me. Okay. But before we do that, first thing I want to do is see what you think. And if you've already read the trend report, then you're, or you're downloading it now in the background, that's cool too. I'm going to ask you a question, and then we're going to look at the answer. So first question here. And you can actively answer this question on your end if you're participating live today. In 2022, demand for in-person activities increased, dis de decreased, didn't change at all. 52% of people thought that in-person activities increased by 70, demand, excuse me, for in-person activities increased by 75% in last year. 48% thought it increased by 35%. I'm saying too many percents here out loud. We all agreed increased, right? I think that's, we're all on the same page about that. Let's see what happened. It was 75%, which feels pretty big. Uh, in fact, it was, that was actually less than the previous year. So in, in uh, 20, from 2020 to 2021, it went up 135% demand for in-person, um, but last year it continued to go up and pretty significantly by 75%. And just for some context, so over the, you know, the 7.2 million bookings, as I mentioned that we looked at, 93% were in-person activities. Okay, so what does this mean for you? What's the actual actionable insight here? This seems like a, an obvious one to me. If you're considering whether to devote your time, energy, and other resources either to in-person or uh, to online offerings, choose in-person. That's where demand is, and it's continuing to go in that direction. Another thing that you may um, be able to have as a takeaway here is that with this increased demand for in-person activities, you can feel more confident in either increasing prices or increasing supply. So there's more demand, right? More people want this thing. So the way to satisfy that is either to offer more of it or to charge more for what you offer because people want it. Okay, cool. Let's look at, um, and as we're doing these, if there are other actionable insights that you have based on the, the data that I'm sharing, by all means, put that in the chat and Dana will call it out as we go along. Two questions this time. In 2022, did average camp prices increase or decrease and by how much? Second question, in 2022, overall customer checkout conversion rate, did it increase, decrease, not change at all? So people are thinking increased by 35% uh, camp prices and customer checkout conversion. And I'm wondering if you're just thinking that because you know that I already used the 75% increased by answer in the previous poll question, which maybe is clever. 
Let's take a look at the data. You were right. CAM prices increased by an average of 35%. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. This was, y'all guess right. This is kind of a big deal. Uh, so prices went up, but it, not just for camps. They went up for semesters, for drop-ins as well. In general, prices went up this past year. Probably not surprising if you bought, I don't know, anything this past year. But something that was really interesting to me is that checkout conversion numbers were unimpacted, stayed steady from the previous year. So in other words, even though prices went up, people were no more or less likely to go all the way through checkout. Um, this wasn't in the poll, but I'll share it as well. 18% of customers on Sawyer used a buy now, pay later option. So like semester payment plan, for example, um, when, when making a purchase on Sawyer. Actual insight. Now is a great time to consider raising your prices because this is what people are seeing and not reacting negatively to, right? Prices are going up. People are still completing checkout. So as your other costs go up, rent, materials, labor, whatever, this is raising prices is a great way for you to help, um, you know, be able to continue to do what you're doing by raising prices. Um, or if not, increase your margins, do more of what you want to be doing. And side by side with this, you if you don't already, you may want to offer buy now, pay later options. So especially as prices increase to let people pay over time. Okay, we got a few more of these here. Let's hit our next poll. In 2022, what percentage of customers who enrolled in a free activity then enrolled in a paid activity within two to three weeks? Dylan, one of the questions while we're kind of waiting for the, the trivia sure. to play out, one of the things that I, I think we hear all the time is, you know, sensitivity around price increases. And some of the comments are, you know, that the increase of camp prices feels as both a consumer and a business owner, like it feels like a high increase. And so I think, you know, one of the things that we're kind of calling out in the chat is obviously you have to look at your supply costs to run the type of camp. So if your labor goes up, but you don't have a lot of hard goods supply or, you know, your materials, you're not kind of having to refresh on a regular basis. That's something that you may not have as large of an increase. Something else to look at that people are highlighting here is like obviously competitor analysis. If your competitors in your area are, you know, increasing, but at a, at a lower rate, definitely look at that and look at how your um, rates need to increase relative. But I'm curious, like if there's kind of any other things that you want to share with the group, Dylan, of like, what should they be looking at as a, when it relates to both being sensitive as a business owner, but also being sensitive, also putting yourself in the parent shoes. Sometimes that can both help and hurt, I think, some of the decision making that business owners uh, experience. So would love your thoughts there. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's it. I think all of that stuff is really great. And, and I'll go back to a few things here that we already learned from the data. And, and one thing I mentioned early on is, you know, you don't necessarily want to look at, at the trend report and say, I need to copy that. You don't necessarily need to say, hey, camps went up 35% last year. I need to raise my prices 35%. Maybe you need to raise your prices more to Dana's point, depending on what your costs are. Um, that's on average, right? So that means that many people raise their prices even more than that. The other thing I'll mention too is that, you know, it's possible that the return to in person had an effect on this, right? If we're looking at camps, online camps are almost always going to be cheaper than in person camps. So as we see more in person camps, that probably is is contributing to this. So you know, it's I think I think the takeaway here, rather than focusing on the thirty five percent, is oh, camp prices are increasing a lot, and then the question for you is. It, what what's the appetite in my community? And you may need you may want to look at what other similar camps are doing. I think it's also really really very okay. And parents even sometimes appreciate it if you ask them about what other camps they're signing up for, and then you can look at those other camps and see what the price increases are. I think to Dana's point, sometimes raising prices can feel like you're asking people to do something for you when that's really not the way to look at it. I think the, the way to look at it is to do the math on what makes you be able to afford to do what you are really passionate about doing, the work that you want to do, 
and the the program that you want to lead, what does it cost to do that? And what do you really need? And it's and look at it less of like a favor that you're asking for parents. And the reality is whenever you raise prices, there are probably going to be some people who would have been able to afford it if you didn't. And I encourage you to, to, to raise your prices knowing that that's the case. And sometimes that might make it hard to do, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the, the wrong thing to do. If you lose one person to that, to, to raising prices like that, but you keep five or six more and they're all paying that much more, it may cover that amount and then some. Um, so these are all things to consider. And it's, it's, um, it's a tough decision, but, but it's one of those things that you have to do over time. And now feels like a good time to do it, given that costs in general going up, people sort of have the appetite for it. Um, so by all means, do it carefully, but it's, it's a good time to consider doing it. Um, let's move forward here to looking at um, free activity conversion to paid activity. I'm going to end this poll that we had started a few moments ago and share the results. So in 2022, y'all are thinking that maybe 35%, maybe 75% of people who enroll in a free activity enroll in a paid activity within two to three weeks. No one thought it was no one. And that's correct. <laughs> uh, it's 35% of customers who enrolled in a free activity, enrolled in a pay, paid activity within two to three weeks. So another thing that I, 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 and we'll get to the actionable insight on that in a moment. Another thing I wanna highlight here, similarly in terms of, you know, thinking outside the box in terms of what you offer, is that there are many providers who diversify their revenue by offering more than just paid class registration. So gift cards, parties, class packs, free activities. That's You may think, oh, that's not really a revenue driver, but a free activity, if 35% of people who enroll in that are enrolling in a paid activity in two to three weeks, that's a revenue driver. So I encourage you to think outside the box in terms of um, what, what you're offering people sign up for. Okay, I'm, I'm moving. I was, I was getting ahead of myself, moving to actionable insights here. So let's go there. So it may be helpful to consider offering more things than just paid class registration. The more ways you let people give you money to support the, the work you're trying to do, the more ways they can do that. Um, and another potential actionable insight here for you is you can use Sawyer's free trials feature if you're not already to attract new customers or set up your own free classes, not using the free trials feature. One nice thing about the free trials feature is that you can enable an automatic follow-up email setting to help encourage that 35% within two to three weeks conversion as well. Okay, let's move on from this slide and let's see what our next question is. In 2022, what percentage of bookings were created on mobile devices, like a smartphone, as opposed to on a computer? It looks like most 45% of people think that 80% of bookings were created on a mobile device, and 43% of people think it's about 60%. But in general, most people here are agreeing that most bookings were created on a mobile device. Let's see if that's true. 39% of bookings were created on a computer. So yes, about 60% were created on a mobile device. That, that surprised me, actually. I'm impressed with how many people got that right in this conversation. So what's an actionable, what's an actionable insight from that? Make sure that your site and your registration experience looks good on mobile. If you haven't done this in a while, pretend you're a customer, go to your website, go to your Facebook page, anywhere where you have registration, go through the process and definitely do it on mobile. Do it on both, but definitely do it on mobile because that's how most people are booking. And if you're using Sawyer, don't worry, everything's mobile op optimized. So definitely do the audit on both, but you're good on that front too. Okay, last one of these. 
I'm going to ask you one more question. Very curious to hear what you think. In 2022, on average, how far in advance did, did families book semester-based programming? Little question. Amy's just asking to define semester-based and what we mean by like semester-based um, activities. Great question. In Sawyer, there is a type of scheduling called semester scheduling, which is traditionally used for after-school programs. That's what we're talking about here. Most people think that semester-based programming is booked two to eight weeks in advance, which is pretty wide range. Let's see what the real answer is. And you're right. Semester-based programming is booked about four to weeks, four to eight weeks, in, excuse me, on average ahead of the start date of the semester. You can also see here drop-ins are booked on average two to four weeks before the, the date of the drop-in. Semesters, again, four to eight weeks ahead. Camps over eight weeks in advance of the start date. So there's the data. Something I want to highlight, though, too, is that this data does not factor in when families look at the schedules, when they research your offerings, just when they actually book. And the numbers also include provider signups, right? So if you're signing someone up at the front desk first day of the semester or a few weeks after the, the beginning of the semester, this data is looking at that too. So probably we're looking at people signing up even farther in advance of this. Um, but the this connects to, to what I have sort of been harping on earlier with camps where you need to have stuff published way, way sooner. So in general, the takeaway here is you need to publish all of your schedules at least a month in advance. And that's just to catch the average customer, right? There are people who are signing up. If that's the average, that means there are a bunch of people signing up even before that, right? So at the latest, you need to have your schedules published no matter what they are a month out, latest. Um, and for camps specifically, again, latest, latest over two months. And really you need to do, as we looked at our camp timeline earlier, you really need to have stuff published way before that because when people are planning their summers, they're, they're doing the research before they're buying, right? If you're saying, okay, I mean, the way this typically works is you look at your summer, you say, okay, when does school end? When am I going on vacation? When am I visiting family? What are the camps that I most want to prioritize? When did those happen? And they're trying to fit everything together. So the sooner you can, you can publish, the better. Okay. A little recap here. Keep, please, by all means, keep throwing stuff in the chat. In a moment, I'll, I'll give Dana an opportunity to, um, to call some of that stuff out. But I want to just, I want to do my highlights, highlights. Okay, so you may be asking yourself, when should I publish my schedules? Although you're probably not asking yourself that because I've told you over and over again that it needs to be before you expect families to book so they can do this research. If it feels like this comes up a lot, so I put this here. If it feels like the price of everything is already going up. Are families still likely to book even if you raise your prices too, right? Everything else is already more expensive. Isn't me raising my prices just one more thing that's harder to afford? Yes, but the data shows that people are completing checkout at the same rates. So this isn't necessarily as risky as it may feel. What should I be offering that I'm not offering already? Consider parties, gift cards, class packs, payment plans, ACH. What is ACH? Some of you may know. How can I attract new customers? Free classes, pretty clear, right? Again, 35% who do free class, do a paid class within two to three weeks. More after that. Okay. I have some questions for you now. And I will give an opportunity for you to ask some questions as well. My first question to you, what's one thing that surprised you from the data? And Dana, I'd be curious to hear if there's anything that surprised it. Maybe nothing surprised anyone, but based on some of the poll participations, I think yeah. maybe there's 
People are definitely, and I think this is a good reminder of like, be surprised and also question how it pertains to your industry, your market, your customers as well, and validate some of these answers, right? You can easily send out surveys to your customers. You can uh, try something new to see if you get some results. So some of the things that have surprised people, definitely the four to six week uh, or the four to eight week um, lead time for semester registration, that surprised a lot of people. Some people were highlighting in the chat that their customers feel notoriously last minute I hear you on that, but you have some marketing tactics and the earlier you put it out, the longer you give yourself to really market it. Um, pricing and, and you know, kind of the conversations around pricing have definitely been surprising to a lot of uh, people in the chat. Um, the 35% specifically that increase last year, I think is something that a lot of people are kind of digesting in the channel here. Um, how far in advance the average family is purchasing things. So again, I think this can sometimes uh, vary based on your built-in audience, right? Like if you have, if customers know that your programs sell out, that is training a behavior of signing up early. If you're putting out your, your offerings like right kind of at the last minute or right at the point that they normally purchase, they're not really seeing the results of a sold out week of camp. Somebody um, was highlighting here in the chat that their camps are sold out. And so if they don't launch it by, you know, February 1st, then parents are like, oh no, I can't get into the programs, right? So like challenging yourselves to do a little bit better. Um, some other things that I think uh, people are just, you know, curious about is, is the mobile percentage. I think surprising people too, that high, like 60, I believe it was 61%. Um, but in general, you know, I think like the things that, that people are, I think everybody's excited about the strong increase to in-person activities, even if it's not surprising, but definitely like how to put all of these things in practice, I think is, is what I'm seeing the most in the channel of like, how does this actually relate to my business? How do I put some of these things into practice? How do I train people to sign up earlier? And then how do I thoughtfully increase my prices as well? I think we also had some, some, I'm always, I think people are always surprised by like the free activities. We're always split in our webinars for people going like, I would never do anything free. People are just looking for a free thing to go to. And the conversion personally is not worth it. So I totally get that. Um, but anyway, yeah, those are some things highlighted in the chat. Yeah, that's great. Um, there was a lot there. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna circle back to every piece of it, but because we landed on the free thing, I think it's worth. I will mention that the 35% conversion in two to three weeks, that's shorter time frame than it was the previous year. I don't remember off the top of my head what it was, but my take is that this probably has a lot to do with the return to in person. I think offering free online activities. Yeah, it's easy to just say you're going to do something for free and then not show up and who cares. Um, but it seems it's seeming to me like those two things are aligned that as we return to in person, the conversion is getting better there. Great. Cool. Thanks for thanks for sharing all that stuff. I have another question for you. What's one thing that was not surprising to you? What's one thing that we talked about today that just feels exactly in line with your experience? from 2022? I think everyone is kind of highlighting the the less online classes, you know, that it it makes sense. I think we've all experienced it in, in some way, shape or form. And also putting yourself in the consumer shoes. Like, I think sometimes you, you have to separate yourself as a business owner. What you would do as a consumer is not necessarily the general behavior of consumers. That's not a bad thing to put yourself in their shoes. Um, it makes you a more empathetic business owner, certainly. And, you know, we're all business owners at the end of the day because you're solving for a need that maybe you saw as a parent yourself or as an, a consumer. Um, but you can't let that just be the only lens that you look at things because otherwise you're not always going to be thinking about how that impacts your overall business, bottom line. Um, I think some of the things that people are also kind of wondering about that we're getting in the chat here um, is like, how do kind of give like how to like I think fairness is always something that keeps coming up in the channel of do you launch and like tell your existing families first do you kind of let it be like everybody can register for those spots that you have available 
some people are kind of highlighting that they have capacity restraints. And so by giving everybody an opportunity, whereas other providers in the chat are highlighting that they do like a special um, kind of launch for their existing customers first, and then open it up for general registration. So those are some things that are kind of happening. Yeah, I, there's there's a lot of good stuff there. I think one of the things that I <laughs> I was hoping might happen, and it seems like it is by asking these two questions, is that some people, people are saying the same answer for these two different questions, which means that, in other words, something that surprised you might not surprise someone else. And it's, it's, it is playing out that way, which I think is another example of what Dana was saying, which is that other people think about things differently than you and other people have different experiences than you. So this goes for your customers as well, right? Just because you're thinking about something in a certain way might not be exactly the way that everyone else is as well. Um, the, I think with regard to fairness and launching, I think this is a really, really, um, it's helpful to think about this things in this way. Something that conversations I've had with a few providers who have felt, um, you know, they've, they've, they've hesitated to reward loyal customers, returning customers, because they've thought that if they're really trying to expand their audience and um, be equitable in terms of who they reach, is that maybe, does that maybe fly in the face of that strategy to, to prioritize returning customers? Is that fair? Um, so that's definitely something to think about. Return, one thing I will say in terms of launching exclusively to returning customers first is that you know, that's a that's an advantage in itself, right? We talked before about doing a loyalty discount for people who are returning. We said, okay, maybe you don't need to do a discount. Maybe you can give them a t-shirt. Something that's even cheaper than a t-shirt is just letting them register. So by letting them register first, that's already a reward, especially if you're a camp that may sell out quickly or has limited capacity. Um, so that's something to consider for uh, as well. Um, I think these are all really thoughtful things to weigh as you as you think about how to launch and in what way to do it. So, you know, I wouldn't pretend to say that there's one answer that's going to be best for everyone, but these are the right questions to ask. So that's great. Um, okay, I have another question for you, which I'm hoping is the right question to ask. What's one thing that we didn't talk about today that you'd be curious to see us report on for next year? Um, so you can throw it in the chat now. You can email us later. We'd love to hear what you would be curious to hear about. Last question, though, for now. Or maybe I have one more. I don't remember. Um, this is the one I'm most curious about. What's one actionable insight that you will take from today? And it seems like the discussion has already been around this, which is great because that's the whole point here is, right, how can this how can this conversation that we've had today meaningfully impact the work that you're doing and, and what can you actually, what's usable for you? Um, so Taylor is messaging his tech guy right now that he needs to review the mobile layout. Um, so that's huge. Um, a lot of people saying I need to launch the next session ASAP, Mel, Diana, I see you. Um, Luana Lai, pricing and launching sooner, definitely. Karen, publishing sooner. Payment plans for everything, something Zach wants to try. That's great. I'm glad to I'm glad to hear that there are some, at least some actionable takeaways here. Um, and I'll say this now, starting, you know, from now until till, to the rest of the conversation today, please feel free to to raise your hand if, and and unmute if you think of anything um, that you have a question about or that you want to if you want to return to one of these questions and share on it. Okay. I'm going to switch gears here for a moment. We can return to any of that stuff later in the conversation, but I'm very excited to share our next new feature that we're going to be launching in Sawyer. Ready? It is ACH. Remember how I said that before and I didn't tell you what I was talking about? I'll tell you now what I'm talking about. ACH is a payment method. Essentially, it's a it's a digital check. So it's it lets someone pay you directly from their bank account. 
uh, as opposed to using a credit card, same as a check, it's just online. So that's what it is. This is what it'll look like over here on the right. Um, why is this a good thing? The main reason this is good is that the fees are lower. So right now, credit card processing fees, it's just, it's one of the things that like, we can't really do a lot about that because that's just what it costs to process credit cards. Um, but with ACH, the fees are much lower. Um, and especially on larger purchases, that's really great for you because you can keep more of the money that people are deciding to spend on your programming. Um, it's also nice to be able to not deal with paper checks, in my opinion. If someone says, hey, can I pay by check? If you have ACH enabled, you'll be able to say, uh, yeah, actually, but you can do that digitally right through your bank account, which is great. Uh, when will this be available? Soon. Look for an announcement um, in your email coming from Sawyer soon when it will be available. But don't worry, if you don't, if there's any reason that you don't want to offer this, you don't have to. Totally up to you. If you just want to keep being able to accept credit cards, that's all good. If you want to accept ACH as well, it won't replace credit cards. You'll still accept credit cards as well. And people will just have the option whether to pay with credit card or via ACH. Um, and it'll be totally up to you whether you want to enable that. And when you're ready to decide if you do want to enable that, we'll have details on the Help Center, which will be included in the announcement email. So stay tuned. This is this is the info we have for now. All the details will be um, announced out soon, but I was excited to share it um, because it's it's an exciting feature that hopefully we'll be able to save you. A lot of questions in the chat about it. Yeah. Um, what I will say, we will be publishing the fees. Obviously, they're on our help center. Um, Zelle is not currently an option, nor is Apple Pay. Um, or Venmo, like that that kind of stuff. So this is through Stripe's integration to accept um, ACH. Basically, it's it's like an electronic payment. Um, it's called an auto clearing house, um, but think of it as an electronic debit. Um, so we will have more info. The uh, percentage, I believe, is 0.8%, but there's some caveats there where there's a max cap rate. And so I want everybody to read our Help Center article, but we'll be sending out more info soon. We're super excited that you're all excited about it. And um, I know that there's some questions here around other payment types as well. We hope to really expand that over time through our payment processor Stripe. Um, but all of this is, is payment uh, rates that they offer. So credit card processing I put in the chat is 2.9% plus 30 cents per transaction. ACH will have its own threshold as well. Um, it is significantly lower. So that's really great. We heard from a lot of our camp programs that that was something that if your parents are interested um, and want to do it, then that's a great way to save on credit card processing rates as well. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Um, the reason I, <laughs> I kept it vague here, I said, fees are lower. It's true. They're much lower. And the reason I'm keeping it vague is not because they're not really that much lower and I don't want to admit it. It's that there's more complexity around how they work. And in terms, there's like a cap, there's like a setup thing. It's because it's a bank account, it's just a little bit more sensitive and complex. Um, but once it's set up, it's really, really easy. So definitely something to consider. And again, all the details will be shared out very soon. Um, but the, the the main reason we we wanted to do this and we're very excited to announce it is because hopefully it it helps you keep more of the money that people have decided to give to you, which is really what we want to try to help with. Um, okay. If there are any other questions about ACH, we can try to answer them, although that's essentially the info that we have now and you'll get to see it soon enough. Um, are there other questions about other things? I know we've done a good job covering things along the way, but are there other lingering questions that people have about other things? Again, feel free to, to write in the chat or to raise your hand and unmute if there's anything else you wanted to discuss out loud. Just kind of want to open it up here. This is uh, Liz from the New York Kids Club. I saw a couple of us were asking, is there a possibility for a breakdown by region of some of these numbers in this report? Great question. Um, you're talking about trend report stuff, right? Yes, sir. Um, so in the trend report, there are some things that I think there's like activity popularity by region, but for, for the numbers that I shared today in general, no, we were looking at everything across all 50 states. So 
you're you raising this, I think is wise and really, really helpful to bring up because again, as, as I mentioned earlier, like this is industry trends, right? Nationwide. This is not necessarily going to be 100% relevant in all cases to everyone's community that, you know, where you are in terms of timing, in terms of, um, you know, all the, all the various factors that make things very unique to you. So, you know, your, your, your situation best. So apply this insight as, you know, to, to your experience. Um, no, we, we don't break it down more than that. Uh, Diana has raised a hand. Feel free to unmute. Okay. Uh, Diana from Weekend PE here in Miami. I have a question. I don't know that you guys can answer it. Um, we're pretty solidified in the party business down here, summer camp. We've been doing it for a while, but we are creeping into it. And so SEO for us is huge. And I'm wondering how the fact that we embed the widget from Sawyer would affect our SEO. So when someone searches summer camp, like would it read it through our site if it's mentioned in the SEO, in the Sawyer widget? Or is it like detached, if that makes sense? So let me just try to make sure I'm understanding the question. So you're saying having the Sawyer widget embedded in your site is you're saying, is that helping? Is that hurting? Is that having no effect on your SEO if someone were to search that? Correct. Like, in other words, is 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 the hit being counted as your site URL or the embedded widget? Correct. That's a good question <laughs> that I, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I have a, I have a hunch here, but I don't want to like go on record and, and say what I think because I'm not a hundred percent sure. Do me a favor, email us that question and okay. we'll get you the hundred percent answer on how that works. Um, unless Dana, you happen to confidently know this. No, <laughs> um, I just no, want I, to tell you the right thing. Yeah, this right. is. I genuinely want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So in, you can email us here. I'll put the support email up, support at hidesawyer.com. Um, any questions ever, you're always welcome to do that. Um, but especially um, just you can mention that we discussed it in the webinar and and we'll follow up with, with an answer that's more confident than anything that I could share today. Okay, sorry. Thank you. I, I don't mean to just talk up, but I can't find where to raise my hand. So this That's is Guadalajara good. over in Merced, California. But I just wanted to say to Diana, it actually improved our SEO. As soon as I embedded the widget and people Perfect. could find us in another route, it improved our SEO. It improved our ratings. And so now we show up above the other theater offerings in the town. I don't know what the actual data okay. will show, but for us, it improved our SEO. Okay, great. Thank you. Love to hear it. Cool. Me too. Um, any other questions? And totally fair game as we're doing to just talk about anything that's on your mind. We got a few minutes here, so I'm down to do my best. And as as you already learned, I won't give you inf any information I won't have. I won't pretend to know something I don't. Jeffrey, what's up? This is going to be our eighth year doing uh, summer musical theater camp, and we've always done one week and we do shows, we focus on material from a different show every week and we put on a new show every week and it's great, it's exciting, but we keep wanting to spend more time and we put out a survey and it seemed like a lot of people would be up for doing like two weeks in a row, but it's a matter of finding out the beginning of the camp, the end of the camp and the middle, which we can kind of take a chance there. My concern is if we do a two week camp and then the rest of the one week camp, my concern is that people are going to be like, oh, wait, but the two camp two week is going to be so much better. And they're all going to try to rush to do that. And then the one week camp is going to be kind of like, oh, but it's just a week. So I'm concerned it's going to affect our registration because it's going to be something better because it's two weeks. We're spending more time. But the concern is how it could affect what has worked so well for us every time. So I don't know if anybody's ever done anything like that. There was one woman who was talking back and forth and was starting to try to help. but. Um, I think the idea, what I want to do is good. I'm just, I'm concerned about how it could affect the other things negatively. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to hear. I know that there are other Sawyer providers who have done two week camps. I think the biggest concern that I often hear when people are considering this is um, actually not one that you raised. The one I hear most is about, hey, 
is this too much of an ask? Are we really going to fill these, these two week camps for, if you're not concerned about filling them, if you're saying, Oh, we can fill the two week camp, that's no problem. Then I would encourage you to go for it because that's much, it sounds like it's more exciting content for you, which is important. It's less work you have to do because if you can fill, you know, twice the amount of time with the same amount of registrations, that's great. Um, and I think, you know, in my experience, it tends to be uh, a little bit, you know, everyone knows that Monday morning of, of a week of camp, everything's a little chaotic, sign-ins a lot, you've got new faces, you've got things reorienting. And if you can do two week camps instead of one and cut the amount of instances in which you have to deal with that Monday morning chaos in half, that tends to help things run a little bit more smoothly as well. Um, so if, if, you're, if your only concern is, um, if, in other words, if you're not concerned about how much you can how much participation you can get for two weeks, which tends to be the largest one that I hear. I think that's great. And I would encourage you to go for it. But again, I, I would love to hear other perspectives on this too, or Jeffrey, if you wanted to say more about I it. I think what well, we typically do six weeks and we do something different every single week. So it's not a concern like, and we'll fill up with that. Last summer was great. We had both camps every week, but the biggest thing was the stress on myself and our staff to week after week, because it's really high quality what we do. And so it's like, this is crazy to put this amount of work into just one week. Um, so I don't think there's a concern about filling it. The concern is, will we fill it if we make it two weeks, two weeks and two weeks? Because our customers, we do know a lot of them try, like we're already getting, Hey, do you know when it's good? So I can plan my schedule and we're leaving this week. When are you? So the concern is that a bulk of our people are do better weekly camp spaced out. and. So the scenario I'm going is like, okay, the first two weeks, we're going to do this special. Everything else is going to be one week. So if we do it two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, there is a concern about filling it. Yeah, um, that makes sense. So it's kind of like I'm in, the, I'm in the midst of this storm, not quite sure which way to try. Yeah, yeah. And if, and if, and if you're not sure, and I'd love, again, I'd love to hear from other perspectives on this, but mine is that sometimes it's best to, to, to not put all your eggs in one basket if you're not sure. You know, maybe you try the two-week thing, but you don't try it all summer, or you offer both alongside if you're able to do that in, in, in the same location or in multiple locations, depending on the scenario. Mm -hmm. um, because that way, you know, the other thing to consider here too is like, you know, with people aging out over time, it might be like a slam dunk to get everyone who knows how great programming is on, on the two-week, into the two-week thing. And then they age out and you're not necessarily developing that next round for next year. So sometimes it's, it's helpful to be able to offer like more of an introductory thing as well. I'm not sure if that's the case here that like a two week is more advanced, but something to consider too is, you know, even though you're most, as I said earlier, like the low hanging fruit or returning customers, just the nature of the business is that you're going to always need to be finding new families as well. So that's something, you know, offering that entry point is something to consider as well. Um, any other, any other thoughts on this? Thank Jessica, you. is that, yeah, thanks, Jeffrey. Jessica, is this related to Jeffrey? You're, you're good to unmute and, and share either uh, way. No, it's not related to Jeffrey. Sorry. All good. No problem. Um, but go ahead. Where, where, where are you at and what are your, what are you interested in talking about? Um, I just kind of wanted to talk about capacity and uh, you know, being able to lower it at some point, because sometimes we have more staff where we're able to have more kids in. And, you know, as it gets later in summer, since we're a summer camp program, sometimes we can't hold that many kids and it gets kind of hard for us to have a whole list of activities. And we just didn't want it to be too confusing for parents. So I know we could always go up, but is there a way to drop capacity? Yeah, you can go down, you can go up, you can adjust capacity as you go. Okay, great. I know um, my colleague Adela is in here as well, and I don't know if she has a little bit more to say on um, our thoughts on this. Sure. Oh, so Adela's question is, will Sawyer programs have an updated feature of changing capacity or lowering capacity on certain programs? For example, adjusting the number of participants attending per day versus doing, yeah, we have this. So great news. <laughs> yeah, I did, yeah, and actually as of, this is a new, as of last summer was the first time that we let you do this by day. You used to have to do it at the scheduled activity level. You could still do it at the scheduled activity level, but you can do it 
by day as well. If you have questions about how to do this, write into support at iSawyer.com and we'll let you know exactly step-by-step step how to how to make it happen. But yeah, absolutely understand what, what you're talking about. And as, as the summer goes, this is partly why to circle back to what I was harping on um, way at the beginning of this conversation, partly why it's helpful to launch stuff so early is to get a sense of where demand is, when people are registering, how many people you can expect. But the truth is that as the summer goes on, things are going to move too. And a lot of times you need to make adjustments and and think on your feet and react. So yes, you can definitely do things like changing capacity along the way. Cool. Uh, Diana, what's up? I have one more question and I think this is definitely the place. Okay. So for camp, we use registration through High Sawyer, 100%. We love it. It's amazing. For our parties, the, and I've written to support about this, the clients having to do a login, I've, you know, I've kind of done like a poll. And so as much as I know it would help us, just that login part has been a deterrent. So I'm wondering from all of our peers here, um, I'm almost like running my own poll, like how everyone who does use it, if they see anything, like if they saw clients lower it because was it a deterrent? Did it not matter? Um, Cause we are always struggling with that decision. Yeah. So I, I would love to hear this as well. One thing I'll say is like, if you are, so for those who aren't familiar the Sawyer parties feature is it's really like a, it's an inquiry form that has a bunch of, that then has like follow through functionality, right? So people can request a party whenever they want. You offer the party packages. So you say what you offer, but they can then request a party for at any time. Um, and then it's up to you to decide, okay, we're going to do it at this time. We're going to follow through. We're going to request a deposit. We're going to change the details and on and on. Um, the if if you need to do instant book parties, then you should not use our parties feature because it doesn't do that. No. But for, if you're just letting people say, hey, this is when I want a party and you want to follow through, um, I think it's a really, really good option. I will say that, you know, people needing to create a login to request a party, um, some <laughs> people may not want to request a party. But if if the old way was, hey, call this number. You can still have a call this number, right? So it's not, I don't necessarily see it as a, as an Well, right way. now, I basically have the version of Sawyer just in my website. And then oh, I get the email, or something. I call them back, and then I resend them an email. And I know because I tried it when I first started with Sawyer, I love what you said, which is changing the time and changing that. And then you wrap it up and you send the request for the deposit. And yeah, it saves yeah. me about two steps. Right, um, right. So it's the same feature, except through my website, I get the email and reach yeah. out versus the login. Um, so that was, you know, I, my poll just was too, too in the wrong direction. And then I feel like I wish I could use it because I do love the features Sawyer has. Yeah. Um, Mel, I'm curious if this is, if you're going to weigh in on this question from Diana. Do you know, I, I wish now that I was, but no, mine is actually a separate <laughs> thing altogether. All Do you good, want me to hold off? No, Do that's okay. Me? What's on your mind, Mel? Okay. And apologies for not putting a video on. I don't want to traumatize anyone. Uh, I'm not very presentable this morning. All so um, it's, my question is, when a parent is registering their child for one of my programs, oftentimes, and I'm not sure why this is, the parent is giving me their information and their date of birth. So let's say Sally is in my class and everyone else is seven. Sally is 42. So the, the parent is filling out the information um, for themselves rather than the child. And I'm wondering if, if anybody else is having that issue. It doesn't happen too often. But I think that Sawyer is asking under the parent part of the registration form for their date of birth as well as the child's. Interesting. Yeah, I wonder if this is, I wonder if there, there's a setup thing here that could make that more clear. Um, we, there are some default form fields that we ask that you can hide and replace with your own. So sometimes that's helpful if you don't love the language that we use. Um, if, uh, I would say, in order for us to like look at this specifically and, and try to see if there's anything we can do to try to help the setup, email support at highsawyer.com. 
Um, okay. But in general, I'll just say that, yeah, our form fields are, are pretty uh, flexible. And when I say form fields, that's registration questions that yeah. are automatically asked during sign up. So, so yeah, this may be something that that we can help with from a, there may be a, a, a different way to, to set this up that makes it more clear that yeah, you're asking I, I questions think of the children. It, it also just feels, um, you know, I'm not sure that every parent is happy divulging their date of birth. So I, I feel a sure, little yeah. bit, you know, sensitive about that being there. Um, so yeah, just, I'll definitely email the support. Great. Cool. Um, Thank you. That, yeah, you're welcome. All right. Jeffrey's back. Um, reviews. So, um, I, you know, reviews and word of mouth has always been the greatest thing for our business and people sharing about it. And, um, we're very proud of the response we get when people are like, Oh, where can I leave a review? And I'm like, Oh, you should have gotten an, You, you will get an email, you know, and often I'll hear that they, they don't see it. They don't find it. So I just, I think I've mentioned this once before to, uh, to Dana, maybe in the past, if there was a way to possibly at any time, just send them a link <clears throat> to a review page where they can, it's not even so much reviewing the class, but their overall experience. I get it. If it's to review the class, that's more specific, which is great. But um, yeah, I would, I would love that because um, that helps us a lot. And it's also something we yeah. can brag about, especially if it's a good review. Yeah, you so, actually, you can do this more or less. Um, so there is there is a reviews page in the, not everyone knows this, but Parents have so you so if you're if you're a Sawyer provider you have your provider portal right you um you know you have access to all your your upcoming classes your schedules your orders everything right you also have a a parent account um, and all parents have parent accounts too um, and there is also a parent portal and within the parent portal there is a reviews page so even if they miss the email they can go to that reviews page and leave a review about not about the provider in general, but about the class that they've taken. Um, so in theory, what you could do is you could go into your own parent account, you could grab that URL, and you could share it with other parents because it's going to be the same URL. When they're logged in, they'll see their reviews page. When you're logged in, you'll see yours. Um, so again, I'm going to say right into support and we can help you find that. You could probably poke around a little bit and find it on your own too. Um, but right into support at highstory.com and we will help you find that that reviews page in the parent portal. And if you want, you can direct parents there too. You can even put something on your site that says, hey, after you take a class with us, make sure you leave us a review here. It's really, it really helps us out. No, but yeah, great. and that's great to hear that that word of mouth is effective because that means you're doing great work. I'm not surprised to hear. Awesome, thank you. Awesome. Um, okay, great. So, I mean, I just, just to wrap up here today, we have covered a lot. As I mentioned at the beginning, we have been recording this today, so we will put it up on the educator resources page, which the URL is right there. Um, this is where we have all past webinars and a lot of other really cool resources as well. So if you haven't checked this page out, I encourage you to do so. And the last thing I wanna say is this conversation has been wide ranging and it has been Awesome. Thanks to your participation. Something something that has come up a few times is talking about the industry-wide trends can be really helpful, but mostly your experience is what really, really matters. So I appreciate everyone sharing it and, and, and taking their own and, and filtering all everything that I'm saying through your own lens here, because that's what's really going to make it helpful. So thanks for coming today. Thanks for participating. Thanks for watching, listening, chatting in, and being a great, awesome part of this Sawyer community. We'll see you next time.